What's up, everybody, and welcome to the Mets Pod, and a welcome to our third live winter meeting special episode. And one reminder here, make sure you subscribe to the Mets Pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Connor Rogers, alongside my always co-host, Joe DeMeo, and our very close friend this week, Andy Martino, in uh, live in San Diego at the winter meetings. Andy, second time this week on the show. And it feels like you've been very, very busy. I heard you got a little early start to the morning oh. thanks to Aaron Judge signing. How are we holding? Yeah, up? it's all. Uh, I'm fine, thank you. But we're tired today. Uh, I was a. Uh, it was fun. It, it the, how talk about how quickly and it's such a weird hour that that came together. I was with Yankee people at 1:30 in the morning, at the local time here in California, and they were so down. They were like, pr they just did not think they were getting the player, and then. Because Hal Steinbrenner is in Italy and we're not on the same schedules. He got that deal done in the hours after that. And then the wake up call came at 530. So, uh, yeah, very. And then, you know, not a, not not a calm morning for the Mets either, because even though it's not high profile, as we were on live talking about Judge, the uh, news broke about Quintana for the Mets. So everyone's busy today. Yeah, that's exactly where I wanted to start. The Mets make two moves today, two notable moves. They get Jose Quintana um, on a two-year contract for the back end of their rotation. They also make the trade for left-handed relief help, something I feel like Mets fans have been screaming for, not just at the deadline, but going back to last year as well, and yeah. Brooks Raley uh, from Tampa Bay. So how did these two moves come together, Andy? Because while they're not the $100 million deals for the Mets, these two should have pivotal roles for the team the entire year. No, look, absolutely. And getting moves like that right is what makes a uh, GM in his front office, his or her front office, successful or not. The pro, like it, and, and everyone knows, every evaluator knows that Justin Berlander and Aaron Judge are good. It's on the fringes of the roster that divisions are won and lost. Um, trading for the right depth guys and the right lefty, and so or in the right back of the rotation guys. So we don't know if those decisions were. Uh, will pay off yet, but we know these are really important moves for any team. Brooks Raley and Jose Quintana, things like that. Uh, how they came together, Connor, to your question, uh, the starting pitching market, that mid-rotation market was really moving last night. Uh, and it's shocking numbers. So the Mets were really in on Jamison Tyone, as you guys know, because we've talked about their offer and was not the $68 million that he got, but it was high. It was somewhere a little lower, but in that neighborhood. Uh, he went to Chicago for a higher offer. Uh, he's off the board. Taiwan Walker, who I thought was going to get a one or two year deal at the beginning of this offseason, gets 72 million over four. This is a guy who wasn't even going to be on the Mets division series roster if they'd advanced, most likely, getting 72 million. So it was like, oh my God, what is going on with these prices if you're a team? Uh, so Epler does a savvy thing, I think. And Gets right in touch with Jose Quintana's agent, who they talked to already, but not hot and heavy. Got a deal done fast. It was like, okay, that guy for two years, who's, who is arguably as good. Look, I, I know he, he's not like a stuff guy. He's more of a pitchability guy, um, Quintana, at this point in his career. And Walker's stuff has a ceiling, but I'd rather have uh, Quintana in my rotation in 2023 than Taiwan Walker. And may, maybe, maybe not Tyone, but he's right there with those guys. And it's two years, 26 million instead of 60, 70 million. So they made a quick pivot and I think a good one. So you mentioned Jose Quintana's agent, another client of yeah, that agent yeah, yeah, is yeah. Kodai Senga, who you've reported that the Mets are still in on. And I am a fan of reading body language and facial expressions and uh, Billy Epler's little smirk uh, this evening talking about Kodai Senga. I don't know if that was a giveaway, but at this point, do you think the Mets should be considered not the, but maybe a favorite for Kodai Senga? And how soon do you think he's going to make a decision? I Well, yeah, first of all, what, what Joe's talking about, for those that didn't see it, when we were in Billy Epler's scrum uh, with reporters today, uh, just a couple hours ago, he was asked about Senga, and he's like, he's a very, very good pitcher. And that phrase, the cat that ate the canary, like he just looked like he had something up his sleeve. Um, that would surprise me because my understanding from the player side has been that they're going to take their time a little bit. Uh, but these things can start moving anytime at these things. It's not like set in stone that the guy has to sign in late December or something like that. So uh, Mets, I, I don't know if I'd use the word favorite, Joe. I, I wouldn't say I have a feel that there's a favorite, but the Mets are definitely very interested. 
Uh, he has said that he wants to play for a, a you know, championship contending big market team, or rather his agent, I believe, said that at one point. Um, so it, it, it certainly looks like it could be a fit. The Mets feel good about who he projects as as a pitcher. I believe we talked about on Monday how um, other teams see Senga as a relief pitcher. Um, so not every other team, but some teams see him as a reliever. Some teams see him as a starter. Uh, so I think there's an argument to be made for, well, you know what Chris Bassett is in in, in Major League Baseball, a, a, a third, a three starter, you know, number three starter. So um, there's probably more upside potential, but more more uncertainty with Senga than a guy, a veteran guy like Bassett. Andy, so you dropped the the nugget today that the Mets are open to the idea of bringing both Nimmo back and a Senga type pitcher in, whether it's Senga that tier of a starter and that would be obviously stretching into a payroll that is uh significant significantly past 300 million so do you think that's a situation that the mets are just looking at the market right now and they're like listen these deals got really really crazy and for us to get to a world series roster this is a level we might just have to go to at this point yeah exactly they don't want to do it and you know, all the way up to steve cohen um because they feel like Hey, we should be able to win at three hundred million dollar payroll. Uh, you can take twenty out of that. I mean, they don't get to take it out of that, but the Robinson Cano twenty million. I, I believe it's twenty. Like that's not their fault, uh, but it's it's still there. So that's part of this. I think is um, Cohen thinking and conveying to Epler like that's the Cano money. You know, don't worry about that kind of thing. So that gives them a little more leeway. Um, and yeah, I I just. They understand, like you're like you're suggesting, uh, Connor. They understand that this is just what's happening right now. It's like all this couple of billion dollars spent already on guaranteed contracts across the league. When your division rivals spend three hundred million dollars on Trey Turner and seventy million dollars, seventy two million on, on Walker, and you just right now the Mets might easily be the third best team in the Ameri in the National League East. So we got to keep going. You're not paying Justin Verlander and Max Scherzer to finish second or third over the next year or two. So it, they, they've taken it this far. So they're like, okay, fine. We'll spend a little more. And that's kind of the vibe I'm catching. Yeah. I think it might be spend a little more and spend a little more. Cause I mean, the, the, they have all these needs that they still need to fill. And unless they're going to shift some money around uh, it, it feels like they're kind of stuck to be spending in that maybe three twenty to three thirty range. Uh, but when you're talking about Brandon Nimmo specifically, um, where's his market stand as of right now? And if, if he is to actually end up departing, is there any more clarity on kind of their backup options? Uh, that's a tricky one because, well, first of all, to the question of his market, um, just same thing we've always been saying, widespread interest. Mets not particularly optimistic, um, even though they love to have him back. Still in it, but there's just a lot of competition. Um, in terms of backup, it's one of the reasons they're so interested in him. He's obviously not a perfect player. A guy going into his 30s who's had a lot of dings and dents over the years and, um, you know, hasn't ever been I – mean, he's a really, really, really good offensive player, obviously, an improved defender. But he's never been the guy that you thought through his career is going to be a $150 million player or something. It's just sort of where things are right now in this industry. Um, so that's why they have to bite the bullet and try to get him back because of the lack of a backup plan. They talk about moving Starling Marte over. They know just as well as we do that he doesn't play enough – he's not healthy enough to be counted on. So you need to bring in a tr another center fielder uh, in addition on the roster, whether that's Kevin Kiermaier um, or whether that's a triple A, like four A type player who can just be a defender in center who you call up from Syracuse when Marte has his IL stint. Uh, you know, there's a million guys like that, uh, but they, the backup plan can't just be Marte. Uh, so that that's, that's, that's what they're saying that it's going to be, but I'm sure they know it's going to be a little bit more than that. And I also saw you drop tonight that the Mets are, you know, considering a Trevor Williams reunion, nothing definite, but just something that could happen. It's kind of funny. We've talked so much about Lugo out of Vino, all these guys that Trevor Williams, such a great player for the Mets last year out of nowhere in a Swiss army knife role, flex starter, long relief, man, whatever yeah. they need. If they did, bring him back do you think his role would remain exactly the same or do they see somebody in williams that can compete for the five spot or compete for a higher leverage bullpen role uh i think they still want to do a uh, 
I mean, he'd be like the sixth starter or six or seven starter on it, depending. And you know, and there's Peterson, of course, and McGill. So he'd be in that mix of guys that it, once they, if they sign a Senga or a Bassett, that's five starters if healthy, right? Uh, that that they would have on guaranteed major league contracts. So Williams, along with Peterson and McGill, could go back into hey, whatever you need. Someone's on the IL, make a start. You know, someone gets knocked out in the second inning, come on in the game. Like that, that kind of role that Williams is so valuable in. And they're talking they're with Williams for sure. He, I've heard he really likes it. He really likes Buck Showalter and the Mets culture. So um, that's something that definitely uh, is a possibility to happen. And he was pretty clutch in um, whatever they had him do. He knew how to handle any role and be, and be fine with it and effective. So uh, that's probably how they would use him again because that's his value is not having to know exactly what his role is. One of the things we've talked about on the podcast over the last month plus talk about Trevor Williams and, you know, just different options. It's like, oh, who could fill the Trevor Williams role? Well, you can hypothetically just fill the Trevor Williams role. Yeah, kind of like Trevor, Trevor Williams. Williams. If only yeah. there was a free agent out there who was like <laughs> Trevor Williams. Yeah, exactly. So, so Andy, what are, what are some other things that you're hearing that are worthwhile for Mets fans to, to keep their eye on looking ahead as the winter meetings wrap up and, the offseason moves into its next phase. What are some things that uh, they should really be paying attention to? Um, well, their needs are pretty obvious, and we've just been discussing them. Yeah. Uh, we haven't talked about trading off the major league roster, which which goes into the payroll conversation. Uh, definitely, there's no reason why. If, they, if you can get someone to take some money on James McCann or Darren Ruff, they would do that. In a heartbeat, uh, they would consider moving Mark Canna. Um, although they like him and aren't eager to move on from him, that's a way to maybe get some money for some other things. They are at this spot with the payroll where, like, if it's going to be Nimmo and Senga somehow, they probably have to, or not have to, but they would strongly prefer to make a move like that. So I would look at those kinds of trades would be another thing. Um, and Apple is pretty good about doing stealthy little moves like the Brooks Raley thing today. So although we, while we can't point to a specific one, um, it's much easier to track free agents because we know who they are. Um, that that the Epler, that's where he lets that's the kind of GM he likes to be. He likes to use his evaluators and and uh, data people to target, uh, you know, your Brooks Raley's of the world and 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 make swing a trade for guys like that. So just to stay in the, on the alert position for things that we didn't see coming, uh, which is different from the way Sandy Alderson was as a GM. Uh, he was deliberate. He'd make one move and kind of stick with the guy. One of many examples being like when they had Adrian Gonzalez at first base one year, he was slumping and Alderson was like, no, we signed him. We're going to stick with him and, and play it out. Uh, Epp was a little bit more like like proactive, I guess would be a word. One Andy, last quick oh, one. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, one last quick one. So you were talking about shedding salaries potentially, and Carlos Carrasco is the name that has come up. If the Mets were to sign – say Kodai Senga, Chris Bassett. I imagine Carlos Carrasco would have a market at one year and $14 million, given what starters are going for. Could you see them moving Carrasco's money to maybe address the bullpen or something else and plugging in a David Peterson at the five spot? Yeah, that could be a possibility. Sure. Uh, they picked up the option because at the time, their entire rotation basically was going into free agency. So oh, there's one guy we have. But if they bring in enough guys and feel like they've made the necessary additions, then sure, Carrasco becomes available. Uh, so, yeah, that could be – I should have mentioned him along with Ruff, Canna, and McCann. That's another guy off the Major League roster that you think could move in, in, in theory. But as with Canna, I'd put him in the category with Canna. They like the player. They're not eager to get rid of him. It's just, you know, maybe you can get, maybe that's a way that you can get creative to, to pare down some money. Ruff and McCann, I'd put a different category of like – let's move on if we can kind of mentality. Andy, we know it's been a crazy week over there in San Diego at the winter meetings, and we appreciate you jumping on with us. We appreciate all your reporting as SMY's MLB insider. So thanks so much and uh, eventually safe travels back. All right. Thanks guys. Always a pleasure. Absolutely. All right. That was Andy Martino. If you're not following Andy already. He's at Martino NYC on Twitter. He's had a Ton of breaking news that kicked off with a bang this week, Joe, with the Verlander news, and it has not really slowed down uh, from there. And a reminder, you're listening to the Mets Pod live, the winter meeting special, night number three. Subscribe to the Mets Pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You can watch on SMY's YouTube or wherever you get 
your podcast. So, Joe, another busy day for the Mets. Quintana, uh, Quintana Rayleigh, two key roles. They're not the, you know, once again, $100 million roles. But when you look at this, Rayleigh is that left-hander in the bullpen that had a career year with the Rays. But let's start with Quintana uh, as he gets the two-year, I believe, $26 million. I was saying to you off the air, I feel like nobody, you know, this is such an underappreciated aspect of Quintana. From 2013 to 2019, he made over 30 starts every single year. And then in 2022, just last year, he made over 30 starts. This is an innings horse in an era of baseball that guys miss time, guys miss starts. Guys don't go to that 160 to 200 inning mark consistently. And Quintana feels like he's exactly that kind of guy for the back of the rotation. Jose Quintana to me is precisely what the Mets needed to add into the rotation. I do think they should be considering another starter. And we talked about Kodai Senga and I'll get to him here in a second, but Justin Verlander's turning 40 years old. Max Scherzer is 39 years old or whatever. McGill's really, been hurt a lot. Yeah. McGill's been hurt. Carrasco's been hurt. They need some, you know, quote unquote, sure innings. As Rubber sure arms. as you could, yeah, as sure as you could get with pitching, which we know kind of there's always injuries with pitchers. And I think Quintana's exactly that. And, you know, maybe he is a four or maybe he's a five at worst, but. I think he emerged in a big way this year. He keeps the ball in the ballpark, which I think will play really well at City Field. And, you know, despite maybe not the big stuff, he does show the ability to elevate the fastball and get some swings and misses when he needs to. And he's inducing weak contact. You know, I think especially when you look at what Taiwan Walker got, you look at what Jamison Tyone got, you know, Quintana feels like an absolute steal for the Mets, you know, at least on the surface. And that transitions now to Kodai Senga who you know we mentioned Billy Epler's little smirk Andy has reported about the Mets interest over the last you know couple days here and I think after signing Quintana they can more afford the risk that comes with Kodai Senga which is you know how is he going to handle moving from pitching nearly once a week in Japan to the five-day rotation um, you'll have the flexibility with the you know, pushing David Peterson maybe down to the sixth starter and Tyler McGill to the seventh starter and Joey Lucchese to the eighth starter. So you're you're building up that starting pitching depth that you can afford, you know, some of the risk that comes along with that. And then maybe you'll be able to, you know, bear the fruits of his upside with obviously the premium stuff that he has. Yeah, this is the fine line of team building, right? The rotation, obviously, and this is, goes for any rotation, but especially the Mets betting on two older aces they have a lot of volatility in their rotation where these guys you almost expect them maybe to miss some time and the reason you pay them that and the reason you're excited about them is that if they hit their ceilings you have a good chance to win the world series but you also need to establish a floor at some point with the rotation and the floor is exactly a guy like quintana that you know is making his starts is giving you innings maybe giving the bullpen a little bit of a breather. And like you said, Joe, a guy that simply does not give up home runs. It's jarring his home run rate. He has 0 0.4 over nine. That I mean, that's, that, that's a and, pretty yeah. unbelievable stat. And what you would think by that is obviously, uh, you know, ball to bat, bat to ball, pitch to contact. The Mets have built up their defense over the years. And sure, there's a big question mark in center field right now. But Francisco Lindor, Jeff McNeil, obviously having a guy like Marte in the corner spot. I, I mean, this fit makes so much sense for the Mets in this market. It, it really does. And, you know, like you mentioned, the defense and, you know, maybe Brandon Nimmo is back. I mean, Andy's reporting on it. And, you know, when I think about this, this payroll situation, where they stand right now after Quintana, after Brooks Raley and Verlander, obviously, the Mets have exceeded the quote unquote Steve Cohen tax, which is the highest threshold of the CBT, but it's dubbed the Steve Cohen tax because he's the one that wants to play in that world. So right now, if they do anything else, they already have the draft pick penalties of their uh, draft uh, first pick moving back 10 spots. 
the financial penalty penalties increased to 90 percent uh, of each dollar so it's 90 cents for basically every dollar that you spend over but at this point the penalties going forward are only money so at this point why wouldn't you just keep going you know i preface it all with it has to be smart baseball decisions i don't i'm not saying go give brandon nemo six years and 170 million dollars because you can but there's there should be nothing stopping him from keep you know keeping going i don't think he's worried about his checkbook so so much yeah you're right the aspect of there's no more penalties so if you're worried about right the one year contract we talk about all the time if Ottavino is one year, 8 million, 10 million, that's important right now. It's it's great that they got a lefty in Rayleigh. It's great that Edwin Diaz is back. Maybe Trevor Williams does return, but you still need more high leverage arms in the bullpen. So that's the market, Joe, that they can play in. We're on the spot always going to be critical of term with contracts because that's where you get yourself into trouble long term. But one year deals is a very, very different place. Um, that the Mets should be involved in so significantly because of Cohen's cash. And I do want to get to the mailbag because the questions have been completely popping off as soon as the show went up on social, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. This first one uh, from Tron Robo Jim on YouTube. Any updates on how likely a Conforto reunion might be? Joe, maybe I'm wrong on this, but from what I've gathered, there has not been a lot of Conforto buzz going around at all. And maybe Conforto's a guy that has to wait of the domino effect of a Nimmo. I know Conforto is not a traditional center fielder, but maybe the top of the outfield market needs to evaporate and judge a Nimmo before movement on Conforto ultimately happens. Yeah, there hasn't been much buzz, but, you know, add them to the list. If Brandon Nimmo gets that huge contract that, you know, I was talking about that maybe the Mets should try to avoid and, you know, he goes elsewhere. Why shouldn't Michael Conforto be amongst the names considered? You know, he's he's been here. He's done it here. The fence is moving in in right field. So maybe that, you know, helps helps him on the on the offensive side of the ball, be able to put up those numbers. Cause I think Conforto's either looking for a one year deal or a two or three year deal with an opt out after the first year, where if he performs really great, he gets to go back, back out into the market and cash in. Uh, so haven't heard much with the Mets. And, you know, it's kind of just bandied about a bit. But I think once the Nimmo domino falls, like you said, at that point, We'll have no choice but to really find out who their pivot is because Nemo would be gone. That's right. All right. The next one is from Daniel Weber uh, on Twitter who asked, are the Mets considering an elite eighth inning option? I know they were interested in David Robertson at the deadline. Seems like a guy who would form a solid bridge to Diaz. I mean, obviously one of the better relief names out there, of course, and a spot that the Mets have not solved yet. The Mets don't really have the guy that's going to be presumably handing the ball off to Diaz in close games consistently, no matter sides of the play. So Joe, what do you, what do you think of the idea of Robertson? Yeah, I think David Robertson fits. He was someone that the Mets were very interested in acquiring at the trade deadline. The cost in prospect capital got too high. I had heard through the grapevine that they were seeking Calvin Ziegler for David Robertson, who was the Mets second round pick in 2021. And they were not comfortable going to that level. And, good for them. I probably would not have done it either, but he's a free agent now. I would consider Robertson. Uh, obviously he has a connection to Billy Epler going back to their Yankee days. And, you know, we talked about Liam Hendricks last night, who that's on the trade market. That's the big money guy. You know, he's making upwards of $15 million that's the high a year. End. Yeah. yeah. That's, the Mercedes. that's the high end. Yeah. But can you get them to, you know, not exactly salary dump him on you, but you know, you take the money and you give very little in return. That could be a, certainly a, an interesting possibility. But you and I have talked about this for going on a month now. We want to see Edwin Diaz closing games and a reliable kind of sure thing in the eighth inning. And then you can mix the rest of it together, whether that's out of Vino. Now, Brooks Raley is a part of the fold. You know, Drew Smith is a part of the fold. And they brought in all these guys like Jeff Brigham and Steven Ridings. And you could work on lightning in a bottle on the bottom half of your uh, bullpen, but I'd really like one or two more like solid. I know these guys are going to perform type of bullpen arms. Yeah. They've brought in, they've gone the volume route on the data darlings, right? The guys that have the slider movement and you just, mm -hmm. 
you throw six darts at the board, and if one makes it out of spring training for a sixth inning, you're like, this is great. So they have a lot of guys like that, um, and, and I'm with you. Hendricks would be that type of player that if the cost, the return is not significant, it's more about the money. I mean, there's your Rolls-Royce eighth inning man, a guy that should be closing on 90% of baseball teams is your eighth inning man to Diaz. The next one from George Burkowski on Twitter, he said, what do we know about Adovino? The latest I have seen, this is from Abby Mastrocco, uh, Mets writer for the Daily News, tweeted from Bu that Buck had said he wants Adovino and Nimmo back. Of course, these are things they're going to say. Adovino, though, Joe, I've said for a long time, logistically, it makes a lot of sense because he's from New York. This has been a homecoming for him. He pitched really well with the Mets. It was a huge year for Adovino, considering where he's at in his career, that maybe because of all those variables, he's willing to live on one-year deals until he hangs it up. That's exactly what I would do. I mean, I wouldn't go multi-year on Adovino. No. I would I would like to bring him back. I think he fit really well with what the Mets did. I think he gelled really well with Jeremy Hefner and this coaching and analytics staff. Uh, so, yeah, give him a year. Give him a raise. He made three or four million last year. Like you said, maybe make it seven at this point. What, what's it matter? They're already over to Steve Cohen tax. So if it costs you another million or two to keep Adam out of Vito in the fold and, you know, bump him down a spot. Like we're talking about getting that true eighth inning guy. Like imagine if Adam out is more your seventh inning guy that, that obviously does uh, better things for just the overall outlook of the bullpen. The next one from Carlos Mar Mar Marin on Twitter said, when will the Mets take care of McNeil and Alonzo before they get to free agency? Uh, Pete Alonzo, by the way, turned 28 years old today so happy birthday pete alonso and he is not a free agent till 2025 he's in his arbitration years but joe i start with alonso before we get to mcneil although maybe they're both free agents 2025 alonso who's 28 mcneil who turns 31 in april i would be floored if they let it get to that point with pete and i think it's bad business not bad business but dangerous business if you do because maybe there's a world right now whereas pete turned 28 today Say you do the contract next year, you sign him when he's in, he just turned 29 and the contract runs till he's 37. You don't want to play the game of the, signing a 30, 31 year old Pete Alonso to a nine, 10 year deal that's he's in his 40s. So I actually think there's a business side of it that makes a lot of sense for the Mets. And of course, the player side of it is they get taken care of and they get that security early. So I would say in spring training, maybe you could start to have those conversations. Uh, at this point in the offseason, we're outlining how many things the Mets still have left to sure. do. Yeah. At the end of the day, Pete Alonso and Jeff McNeil are under contract to the Mets for the next couple seasons. So it's not a requirement that they get it done. It would be nice if they uh, pursued, I'd say more so with Pete than McNeil for the long-term deal. Uh, but at this point, it's more important to build the team around them for 2023. That, that takes priority over the extension. But when you get to spring training, Start having the conversations with the agents, see where they're at, see what they're yep. looking for. Some guys don't um, want to do this, by the yeah. way. Yeah, Not everybody's like, the Braves. They could want to ride it out to free agency because they're in arbitration. They're a couple years away at this point. You know, maybe they do want to ride to free agency, even if they end up staying with the Mets. So I'd begin the conversations, but let's fill out the baseball team first. Exactly. And also, it doesn't affect this year's luxury tax payroll. These are deals that. The arbitration's bought out, and then you're going into deeper years beyond that. McNeil is a guy that I think they would, if they did it, they would approach it in a sense of you're not going to hit free agency till you're 33, I believe. You have some injuries in the past. Let's give you a contract that pays you through 35 years old. If he's not interested in that, then McNeil genuinely might be a player that goes right down to the free agency wire in 2025. But we are focused on the now. The next one from Michael Chat via YouTube. Do we think the Mets will look to young guys to step up? Beatty, Vientos, Alvarez, Joe and I have outlined a lot. The Mets, you know, maybe the number one thing the team needs to improve on from last year to get over the hump is thump, power, and they need to get it from one of those guys. One of those guys has to contribute power. Now, Alvarez I, is very ideal because he gives you an advantageous position of the catcher position gave the Mets, I believe, six home runs combined from McCann and Nito last year. If Alvarez gets you 22, which is a pretty low bar for a player of Alvarez's caliber, that is a significant upgrade in home runs from the catcher position. So, Joe, we say it all the time, but 
one of those three guys will contribute to the Mets this year, and Alvarez is far and away the safest bet. I've said this on the show a couple times, and I said it at our live show at the Queens Baseball Convention. I would do whatever I had to do to get James McCann out the door. I know it's e way easier said than done, but I would be per pushing that really hard because I want Francisco Alvarez catching on opening day for the Mets. I understand he needs more refinement. I understand he needs work, but they need thump in that lineup. And he feels like a guy that they'd consider for the DH spot, you know, opposite Vogelback. And I don't want to do that. If, if you think Francisco Alvarez is a catcher long-term, which the Mets need to answer that question if they do, but if you think he's a catcher long-term, I think you're wasting time making him the designated hitter. He has to catch. You might as well, you might as well just send them back to AAA and let him catch, you know, the AAA arms that the Mets have. But I think the only way he's going to get better at catching is catching big league pitching. And who better to learn from than Max Scherzer and Justin Verlander and the like that are in the Mets rotation now? You'll deal with some bumps in the road, but that comes along with every single young player that you call up. You accept the fact that things aren't always going to be from day one. Everything's perfect. Sample it at the beginning of the season. So that way you can deal with the bumps in April and May and maybe even into early June or something. But then by the end of the summer and in the fall, Alvarez is way more comfortable and we're not having maybe the same conversation. This next one from Sadiq Rahman on YouTube. He said, what do you think about the Mets trading for Tyler O'Neill? Would add power and athleticism as a potential Nimmo replacement. I'm a big fan of uh, Tyler O'Neill. The, you know, obviously the issue with him recently is, and honestly, not recently, this has kind of been a consistent theme for him is health. Um, last year was a disappointing year for O'Neill. He only played 96 games. His OPS was at 700. He hit 228. The on base was only 308. He kind of had a power surge in September, I believe, that got his numbers up to look respectable. When he's on, this is a guy we've seen hit 34 home runs in a season. I have not, I, when I see the Cardinals talk about him, it's been a lot of hope in a bounce back year. I don't know how open they are to actually trading him, but with players like that, you you don't know it until it actually happens. So Joe, I guess I'll frame it to you like this. What do you think of O'Neal as a player, number one? And two, do you think that's a solution to the Mets' potential outfield woes that feel like are, they're going to be a reality sooner rather than later? Yeah, I mean, I like Tyler O'Neill. He brings exactly what the Mets would look for. There's athleticism there. There's power, power there from the right side. So, like, to me, he makes sense. But the Cardinals just signed Wilson Contreras to a five-year, $87 million contract. Uh, Nolan Arenado opted in. The Cardinals are trying to win. So, I don't know what their motivation would be to trade someone like Tyler O'Neill, especially off a, you know, selling not low. as great. Yeah, it would be selling low to an extent. So, um, he fits, and I think you're barking up the right tree as far as if Nimmo goes, maybe the trade market is where they'd have to find that outfield replacement. I just I just can't envision the Cardinals moving on from someone like O'Neal. I'm with you. All right, last one of the show. Uh, this one is from DWX on YouTube. Aside from Jose Buto, any pitcher in the farm system who could be that reliable long relief option, similar to Trevor, Trevor Williams. Joe, that is right up your alley of this. And I know it's almost every week we remind everybody there's not much pro level pitching in this system right. outside of Buto at best that's ready to contribute. Is there anybody you think that, listen, they don't have to start the year out in the Trevor Williams role, but maybe by August they could find their way up and handle some innings? I mean, not really, if I'm being totally honest. Honestly, like, they're yeah, bare like, bones in AAA. Uh, you're looking at Buto. I mean, Eliezer Hernandez was a guy that they, he's not a prospect, but they got him um, from the Marlins in trade. He's a guy that would fit that mold. Um, Joey Lucchese would fit that mold. Uh, Tyler McGill, if you want him to, could do that. Maybe even David Peterson. Like, I think the Mets have a ton of options. And um, the Trevor Williams role, like I said earlier, could potentially be filled by Trevor Williams. And you, you don't have to worry so much about it. But as far as pitching prospects, um, to just take it from a general perspective, um, Buto is the one to watch. Uh, he struggled in his one start here at the big league level against Philly. Then he went back and dominated in AAA, had an ERA of 1.06 in the month of September. Um, and then you're looking at a couple of 2021 draft picks that should start in AA Binghamton, which you know doesn't necessarily for sure put them on the on the trajectory for a 2023 debut. 
but we saw Tyler McGill start in double A and end up in the big league. So it's possible. And, and those two guys that I would say, keep an eye on are uh, Dom Hamill, who is the third round pick by the Mets in the 2021 draft and uh right-hander Mike Vassell, who's someone that the Mets feel they stole in that draft. Uh, he was a guy that was a top 25 prospect in the entire MLB draft class when he was in high school, uh, decommitted from the draft to go to college, got changed into like a sinker slider guy and, his, his stuff just didn't work there. Uh, Mets took him and brought him back to becoming a four seam, you know, curveball guy and fastballs up to 97. So the, those are a couple interesting arms, but I'd say that they're more likely to be 2024 things, but you never know if they perform really well at double a, uh, it could happen. Yeah. I feel like that role is going to belong to a veteran Lucchese hanging around. I mean, like you said, Eliezer Hernandez, there's a lot of different options, but it'll probably be mostly veterans that you forgot were in baseball and have a good spring or do well for the Mets in AAA. Mets are just a year or two away from some of their prospects making their way up the system. So that wraps up our week of uh, winter meetings coverage. And it was great. A big thank you to SMY MLB insider, Andy Martino for jumping on with us Monday night. Uh, on Wednesday night, and shout out to Steve Gelbs for jumping on with us Tuesday. And thank you to everybody for tuning in. This has been a lot of fun. And a reminder to subscribe to the Mets Pod, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You can watch on SMY's YouTube or wherever you get your shows. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll talk to you soon.